So I wasn't born privileged. I definitely wasn't born resilient. I was, however, born into poverty. I'm the premature twin sister, the daughter of a single mother. I can tell you, my brother and I struggled from the start. You see, my mom was the middle child of the first interracial couple in a small rural farming community in eastern Washington. She grew up the daughter of a feisty white woman who grew up in the backwoods of northern Idaho. The daughter of a post-slavery son of a Pullman porter who trained at Tuskegee in World War II. So my mom was no stranger to adversity. She was an unwed, mixed-race mother at the age of 20 who would turn to drugs and alcohol as a way to cope with her lot in life. This was the foundation on which my life has been built, on which I've built a career and a family. It's the foundation on which the house inside my head in which I now live has been built, the foundation for the house that poverty built. You see, any good house requires four walls. For the house that poverty built, some of those walls were built for me in the everyday bullying tactics that my mom used to gain compliance. And some of those walls were built by me in an effort to shield myself from the anger and frustration of a young mom trying to raise three kids on her own. It wasn't until I had been in foster care for the third or fourth time at the age of five that I would come to realize that the house inside my head was built entirely of brick and thrown stones, with no windows or doors to the world of opportunity that lay beyond my mom's vision for my future. I thought I had built a safe room. It turned out to be a prison of self-doubt and an overabundant need to please other people. It wasn't until my brothers and I ended up in foster care together that same year that I would gain an understanding that the tiny, one-room, brick space, the house that I was living in inside my head, didn't have to be. You see, thanks to my foster parents, I got my own room for the first time. I got the chance to get three meals a day, to have clean clothes. I got the chance to play softball and to learn for the first time what it meant to just be a kid. But more importantly, I got the chance to make decisions for myself for the very first time. So thanks to my foster parents, I started blueprinting in earnest. I was making mad plans for the house inside my head. I was going to build a kitchen where I no longer had to go hungry, a garage where I could store all of the memories in which I no longer wanted to live in fear of, a roof over my head to keep out the rain and the cold. Eventually, it would be my middle school teachers and my high school teachers who were the biggest influences on my ability to reimagine the house inside my head. They would open up worlds of opportunity through reading and writing, they would help me discover a lifelong love of learning. But most importantly, they would create a sense that I was someone who mattered, that I was truly a wanted human being. So it was in the middle of all of this blueprinting in earnest, right, where I was making these mad plans for the house inside my head, that my mom would return at the age of eight and she would burn my house to the ground. She didn't need an actual match. You see, her addiction was the flame that would tear our family apart because my brothers and I were actually doing really well after foster care, thanks to the introduction of my stepfather. My stepfather is by far 
the biggest influence on the design for the house inside my head in which I live today. He was the first person I'd ever met who'd gone to college and told me that college was an opportunity. He was the first veteran I knew who talked about his service and would encourage my brother to join the United States Air Force. He was the first man I knew who would change and shape my understanding of male relationships for years to come. You see, my stepfather was the foreman on the first major overhaul that the house that poverty built inside my head. And he taught me that there really are nice men who exist in the world. Sadly, my mom and her addiction would drive that one stabilizing force in my life away. And at the age of 16, I would end up homeless, literally and figuratively. But it's okay. <laughs> Thanks to my grandma, to my high school English teacher, to my high school counselor, to my best friend and her family, who all stepped up to help me rebuild my life, to rebuild the house inside my head. You see, this is probably the point in the story where you're expecting me to say, yay, great, this is the perfect time to get out from underneath the house that poverty built, to move to a new home, right, to rebuild. But it was the blackened, cracked foundation that was my only option to rebuild on. You see, there is no insurance policy for people like me who lack self-confidence. And I had yet to, to build my resiliency piggy bank. So it wasn't until I got a full-ride scholarship to college that I would have the opportunity to rebuild. It was thanks to all of the people in my community who recognized that the windows to the future in the house inside my head were boarded up and covered in plastic, but they knew that the memory of the vision still existed, and they were willing to invest in me, to invest in my future and my opportunity to move forward. However, like any good homeowner, it doesn't matter how far you travel, home is where the heart is. It's the place you always want to come back to. And for me, I kept coming back to the tiny, one-room, windowless brick house. Not because I didn't know I couldn't have more, but because I didn't know how to make the investment. And worse, because I didn't believe I deserved it. It wasn't until a college classmate of mine helped me realize that the house inside my head was simply something I was leasing from my mom, and that houses get remodeled every single day, that walls can be torn down and rebuilt, that rooms can change, and that if I didn't like the view or the space was too dark, that I had the ability to put in a window and change the lighting. Now, you might be saying, well, duh, Captain Obvious. But for me, this was a pivotal life moment. This was the moment that everything changed. Because you see, it took the messenger changing. It took getting a real estate agent who could help me see that the house inside my head had value that I had value, that I was able to forgive my mom and stop carrying around her baggage. So while the house inside my head may have been built on the foundation of poverty, it may have been shaped by transition and by trauma, I discovered the privilege in being able to redesign, to remodel, to rebuild my house. So let me ask you, 
What does the house inside your head look like? Is it something you've built for security, for warmth, for happiness? Or is it a prison you feel trapped in every single day? Maybe it's a combination of both. Because you see, we can't change the foundation on which the houses inside our head are built, but we have the power to build and remodel every single day. You see, the tools for me were all there. They were packed away in the garage with all of the memories that I was trying to forget. But it was really in those memories and those lived experiences that I learned the most valuable lesson of my life. That while I may not have been born privileged and I may not have been born resilient, I had been building those tools every day of my life just by surviving. So now think about the house inside your head. What would it look like tomorrow if you knew that you had the tools packed away in your garage? If you knew that your friends and neighbors, that the community around you were willing to come over and help you rebuild? What would that house look like? Would you remodel it? Would you redesign it? Would you rebuild? What would that house look like? So I'll simply say, thank you, and welcome home. <laughs>